But tonight we have the privilege of having not one, but two speakers. They're going to speak to us on tort law. And I want to tell you just a little bit about them. Um, our first, well, our second speaker, actually, I think he's going to back clean up for us, um, is a trial lawyer from the state of Alabama of many, many years. Um, he's served this state in many capacities um, as a officer and president of the Alabama Trial Lawyers Association, which is the predecessor to the Alabama Association for Justice. Um, I first heard of or met uh, Delane Mountain when I was in law school with his wife Barbara and at that time he was teaching at the law school. He has gone on to um, be a faculty member for the American Trial Lawyers College of Trial Advocacy. He is a um, board certified trial lawyer which is a pretty big deal. Um, it takes, a, uh, takes quite a bit of work and quite a bit of experience to qualify to do that. And has served the Alabama trial lawyers in many capacities as well as this state um, state bar or this local bar association excuse me um, and most recently um, was elected a member of the American trial lawyers association top 100 trial lawyers so we're gonna have a real treat tonight um, now I have a note from Alan who wants me to say just a little bit about the Alabama Association for Justice um, the mission is to make sure that any person who is injured by the misconduct and negligence of others can get justice in the courtroom, even when taking on the most powerful interests, to eliminate civil justice restrictions, to ensure the members have the tools needed to provide a level playing field through timely ethical and educational programs, to strengthen the civil justice system so that deserving individuals can get justice and wrongdoers can be held accountable. To strive for equality in the one room where individuals and powerful interests are held accountable. And that is our American courtroom, like we're sitting in here right now. Now a really good thing about, um, about this evening is that we're getting um, two speakers for the price of one. Um, I'm sure, has anybody talked to you about the trial process and just how opening statements and closing statements and to go, I, I see some head nods. Well, it's, it's cust a little bit, well, it's, it's customary um, when a, a, in a big case when there's more than one lawyer to have um, the junior lawyer talk and set, set the stage and then the, the, the gray hair comes out, no offense to Lane and you know cleans up and makes that stirring closing argument so that's what we're expecting tonight fellows um, and our first speaker will be Delane's son Clint who is a fairly recent graduate of the University of Alabama School of Law although not that recent um, 19 and uh, 2003 excuse me not 19 and he also practices with the firm of Mountain Baird and Mountain in Tuscaloosa Alabama and we know he has uh, learned at the feet of the master. So without saying anything further, I'm going to turn the podium over to Clint and he will begin to speak to you about tort law. As she stated, my name is Clint Mountain and I'm an attorney with the law firm of Mountain Beard and Mountain in Tuscaloosa. And primarily what we handle are civil torts and I have chosen that for my subject here today. I'm gonna give you all a little bit uh, of just a basic outline as to how we approach things. Um, uh, most, of the, most of the cases that we have uh, are centered around uh, negligence uh, and uh, or what we call uh, a non-fault based tort or, or negligence based tort. Um, uh, there are different degrees of negligence and I'm just going to start today by talking about the lowest level which would just be uh, plain negligence. Now past plain negligence or simple negligence we have what's called wantonness uh, and if y'all want to y'all can follow me around in, in my outline um, and it starts with the topic of negligence um, wantonness is a little bit more than uh, than negligence simple negligence is where someone has breached a duty that they have and caused a harm to another individual and we're talking about simple negligence and wantonness 
generally we're speaking about a civil courtroom and I guess y'all have all been here long enough to know the difference between a civil trial and a criminal trial. Now sometimes these two will overlap. Let's say for the instance if we have an assault and battery. You would have a criminal remedy where the state of Alabama would serve as the prosecutor and they would prosecute the offending party and seek a punitive damages against him. Now not the punitive damages that we think of in terms of monetary punitive damages but punitive damages that are intended to punish, i.e. rehabilitation or incarceration. So sometimes we get in a little overlap. Now, it doesn't happen very often. What we're talking about today is the civil courtroom, where an individual or an entity has another action against someone else for a breach of some sort of a duty. Now civil, uh, civil negligence starts with, with just simple negligence, which is made up of four parts. The first of which is a duty of care. You have to have a duty that you're owed to someone else. Just like when you drove your car here today. Everyone has the duty to operate that in a safe, in a safe manner by the rules of the road. Now, the second step is do you have a breach of that duty? Was there something that happened where you breached that duty that you owed to another person? And in doing so, did you cause a harm or a damage to someone else? And let's, let's talk very simply about, uh, about how this arises. As I stated before, we do a lot of automobile accidents. And let's say uh, this nice young woman here in the, in the teal sweater, she runs, uh, she runs a stop sign and runs into someone. Well, where do we start? Let's start with what her duty is. Now, her duty is to operate a, a, an automobile in a, in a reasonable and safe manner as anyone else on the road would do. That was her duty. She didn't stop at the stop sign as the rules of the road and the laws of the, the city of Huntsville and the state of Alabama suggest. So she's breached that duty. Now, when she ran that red light and she hit someone, did that collision cause an injury and was that person actually hurt? And that's sort of how we walk through and that's sort of an overview of what I'm going to talk about tonight. So let's begin by talking about risk and duty. And if y'all have any questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Did I see a hand? Go up to the back. I was going to ask you, uh, sure. in that accident there, I was driving by, did I have a duty to stop by not stopping? Did I breach the duty of Good Samaritan? Uh, no, you didn't. Um, uh, you don't have a duty to stop, uh, and even if you did have a duty to stop, then you may not have actually caused it harm. I think that we all know that there are a lot of differences between what we do in our everyday with our morals and, and how we view uh, our fellow man than actually what happens with the law. And that would be an instance where, no, you don't have a duty to stop, but me as a person, I would. Um, so let's start talking about our duty. And when we look at duties, duties can create, be created in several different ways. Uh, a duty can be created by contract, a duty can be created by uh, a statute, and it can be created by common law. And when you look at the duty, first you want to analyze the risk. Is the conduct that the defendant undertook unreasonable? Is it a type of conduct that the utilitarian view of it, meaning what it's actually used for and the purpose for it, is it outweighed by the risk that it created in doing so? And you can look under heading number one there where it starts with risk and the imposition of risk. And, number, and letter B is whether the risk was unreasonable. And you're going to hear a lot about what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. Because when anybody's evaluating a tort, the standard is what would a reasonable person have done under the similar circumstances? What's the reasonable person supposed to do? And that's restated here in the restatement of second. And if y'all have never heard of that, the restatement second is a little book that's about this big and it condenses all of the federal, uh, all federal and state uh, tort law into a very easy type of a handbook to look at. And so you'll see in here every now and then it'll say a restatement second or a restatement of this and that's sort of the benchmark that everybody goes to to look at when they're doing some research on whether it be tort law or contracts. Um, as I said, the duty is created either by contract, by statute, or by common law. Now, it states that you have to act in a reasonable manner, but it also happens if you fail to act. And that's more illustrated too by contract as well. Well, let's suppose, I'm going to keep picking on you. Let's suppose this nice young woman, what was your name, man? Nancy. Nancy is drowning. And like you said, you're an onlooker, and you see Nancy drowning in a pool. Do you have an affirmative duty to jump in that pool and save Nancy? 
Do you? As, as an onlooker, under the law, no, you don't. You do not have to jump in the pool and save Nancy. Now, at the same time, let's suppose there's a lifeguard standing by watching. Does he have a duty to jump in? Yes, yes he does, because he is in a contract and has a business relationship with whoever owns that pool to save lives. He can't say, well, you know, that's, no, that's, that's out of my league. I, I'm not going after Nancy. Yes, he does, but an onlooker does not. Now, if an onlooker does jump in after Nancy and says, go ahead, lifeguard, you go call the police, I'm going to jump in, I've got her. He can't go halfway out there and say, ah, you know, that's, she's out there. I didn't think she was that far in the deep end. I'm going to come back. Once you've started that duty, once you have made that undertaking, then you do have a duty. And that's uh, what I illustrated there was what's under here is number three, assumption of the duty. Um, now another way that act or omission is created is let's suppose Nancy is driving her car and she runs a stoplight again. This is her second accident today. <laughs> and she runs a stoplight and she hits, uh, she hits uh, uh, someone by the name of Mikey. Mikey's a friend of mine back in Tuscaloosa. Hello, Mikey. And runs a stoplight and hits Mikey. She sees that Mikey is in peril. The car is on fire. It looks like the car is going to explode. He's hurt, and what does she have to do? What is her duty there? Does she have to run out and save him? Maybe not necessarily, but she does have a duty to at least try and get some help for him. At that point, she has created a duty by her own acts. By creating the peril which the plaintiff is in, she has created a duty for herself to now help the plaintiff and help them out of that situation. You know, when we're talking about the reasonable standard or what a reasonable person would do, it takes on a very objective standard. And what that means is they're not going to look at, and let's suppose, what was your name, sir? WK. WK? Okay, let's say that WK has uh, some sort uh, of a, um, let's say he's got a bad temper. <coughs> let's say he's got a real bad temper, and if you start messing with WK, He's prone to fight. Well, when you're looking at a reasonable standard, it doesn't look at just what WK would do. It would look at what a reasonable person would do. So if you have shortcomings as a bad temper or you have other types of, of personal flaws or defects, they're not going to look at, okay, well, let's look and see what WK would do in a reasonable instance. We're going to see what a reasonable person would do. So if you have someone who has uh, mental, mental attributes like that, we're going to look at what a reasonable person would do, not what just WK would do. Um, if you have other people like children, there's a different standard for children, and that's actually set forth by statute. I believe it's, it's one to eight or nine years old. There's no fault. And then from nine to 14, it is what a reasonable child of that age would do. And that's a subjective standard rather than just the basic reasonable person standard. Uh, something else that differs from criminal law when we're talking about a reasonable person's standard is intoxication. Now, as you may or may not know, if you are intoxicated, whether it be alcohol or drugs, and you kill someone on purpose, there are instances where you will not be held for the first degree or capital murder because you have to have the requisite intent to commit that crime. Now, if we're talking about negligence and acting negligently as a reasonable person, intoxication is not a defense. You can't say, well, I wasn't acting like a reasonable person because I was drunk. That doesn't fly. Well, you were the one that engaged in that conduct. You were the one who went out and got someone hurt. Now you have to pay the consequences. Another standard that's used is not only the standard of just a reasonable person, but what are the customs and what are the other types of, uh, of common knowledge that's known within the community? Um, if you're looking at a products liability case, let's suppose someone, let's suppose WK, when he's not out yelling at everybody and fighting, he is building skill saws, large skill saws that you use for, uh, for cutting wood. And let's say it is standard practice for every skill saw made to have a warning label on it. And WK wants to cut some corners and doesn't want to put a warning label on his. And he's probably in a bad mood, a little irritated. So he doesn't do so. One of these skill saws hurts someone. Well, you can look at what is the custom and the practice within manufacture of skill saws, not just to say, 
well, what would a reasonable person do or what would a reasonable manufacturer do? But this is customary within the practice. This is customary when you make saws and this is customary to help protect people. Therefore, if everyone is doing it and it's a custom in practice, then you, sir, should have done it as well. And had, do it, had you done so, you might have prevented this harm. Now, we also talked a little bit earlier about uh, where our duty is created. And we talked a little bit about contract. We talked about our lifeguard. Now let's talk about a statutory standard. Now there are certain instances where you will have a remedy by statute. And going back to our skill saw, if we were going to sue a product's liability case where a product has injured someone, we would be going under the Alabama Manufacturer Extended Liability Doctrine. And what that is is that is a statute that sets forth what a manufacturer has to, does, has to do to protect consumers of that product and it also sets forth what a plaintiff has to do to recover under that statute. Now some other statutes can also be used. We talked a little bit earlier about assault and battery and how these two actually overlap in both the criminal law and the civil law setting. Let's suppose someone has committed an assault and battery against WK. That person is taken to trial and they meet the elements of the, the assault and battery criminal statute which would be the unlawful touching, striking of another person with the intent to cause that person harm. Let's say you meet each one of those elements. You struck WK. He had the intent to hurt WK, and he did in fact hurt him. Well, you've met all of those, and he's convicted criminally. Well, at the same time, you can also pursue that statute as an assault and battery. You can take that conviction, and you can apply it to the civil standard. And once you've been convicted of a crime, in particular a felony in Alabama, then it is also actionable actual civilly. You all know the standard for convicting someone in, in the state of Alabama of a crime. You've probably seen it on television a hundred times. Beyond a reasonable doubt. There you go. Beyond a reasonable doubt. And that standard is about right here. That's a, it's a pretty tough standard. If we were looking at it numerically, it would probably be about 90-95% certain that someone has done something. If we're looking at a civil setting, it's either by a preponderance of evidence or just more than 51 percent. So it doesn't have to be as high a standard as it is for a criminal case. So therefore, if you have convicted someone of a criminal offense like an assault and battery, you've already met the threshold, you've already met past your threshold that you have to do for, for civil liability. <clears throat> now we also have special classes of persons who do not fall within the reasonable standard or just a reasonable person. Now, when Nancy's operating her vehicle, we all know how someone should operate a car. We've all taken the driver's test. We've all had to look at that little paperback book, and we've had to sit down and take that test. And we're all familiar and have access with the rules of the road and know how to operate a vehicle in a reasonable manner. Now, let's suppose the person we're talking about is a professional, is either a physician or an accountant or an attorney for that matter. If you're going to sue that person for any type of a negligence, it's a different standard. The standard is what a reasonably situated professional in the same circumstance would do. So what does that mean to me as a practicing attorney and what does that mean to you as a potential plaintiff? That means if a doctor has done something to you, let's say a doctor has potentially committed a medical malpractice against you, you have got to find someone who is similarly situated to tell you whether or not they have done something wrong. Even though it may be very obvious, let's suppose they cut the wrong foot off or something like that, it's very easy to say, well, yeah, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. But you're still going to have to have someone who has the professional qualifications of that doctor to come in and say, yes, this is the procedure that they followed, this is the procedure that they should have followed, and now this is the harm that we're left with. Same thing for an accountant, the same thing for an attorney. A lot of people, particularly in the state of Alabama, won't take medical malpractice cases because it's very hard to get a doctor to testify against another doctor. So lots of times you have to go out of state or find someone else that will help you. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind practically speaking. It's very easy. I get a lot of calls from people talking about medical malpractice and say, I went and had surgery and my back still hurts. I think the doctor messed up. Well, did you go see another doctor? No, I haven't. But you're just sure that the doctor messed up. Yeah, he messed up because my back still hurts. Well, what are the reasonable expectations for the surgery or the procedures that you have? I mean, you have to have a little bit more than what you think a doctor should do impose any type of a duty on that person. Uh, guests in an automobile. Has anybody ever heard of the guest statute in Alabama? The guest statute in Alabama states that you're a passenger 
in a vehicle and the driver commits an act of negligence, simple negligence, you cannot recover. The driver is shielded. Say Nancy just ran a stop sign and you're a passenger in her car. She runs a stop sign and runs into a tree and she is simply negligent. You can't recover against her. You cannot get any recovery. Now, let's suppose Nancy was drinking, playing with the radio, speeding, and, and ran the stop sign. In that instance, you would have a good case for wantonness, which is a little bit more of a culpability than our negligence standard. She did more than just simple negligence. She gave more of a willful disregard for her duty to her passenger. And if she is wanton, or even reckless, or did it intentionally, then yes, you can recover against her. But if it's just simple negligence, you can't. Now that's not the same as it is in Mississippi. Mississippi has gone away from the guest statute. So how do you get around the guest statute? Well, let's suppose WK is riding with Nancy and he buys the gas or he buys her lunch in exchange for a ride. Then he's no longer a guest because he has provided some sort of consideration for the ride that he's receiving. And in that instance, yes, you can. You can sue for simple negligence. But if there is no consideration, then there is no simple negligence claim. Now we, yes ma'am. What about the insurance, automobile insurance with that, that might pay for that? And this young lady was asking up front, she was asking about what about the insurance that would pay for that? And the insurance covers her for her acts and it would also include negligence. So not only can she personally assert the defense of the guest statute, but her insurance that would pay for any wrongs against her will also assert the guest statute. So if you don't have a claim against Nancy, you, can't, you won't have a separate claim against the insurance. The insurance will cover you for your wrongs by contract. By contract, you pay your premiums so that they back you up and they financially will support you if those types of things happen. But they can assert, they, they step in your place, and so they will assert the same defenses that you're able to, to assert. So yes, you will be barred by getting it from Nancy or the insurance company by the guest statute. How about a civil suit? Would you bring a civil suit? That would be the civil suit. The civil suit would be based on negligence. So what I'm saying is when you file, when the plaintiff would file a suit, you've got different counts that you can bring. Uh, you could bring a negligence count, you could bring a wantonness count, a reckless count, or an intentional act count. The intentional, of course, is going to be where someone, where Nancy intended to hit the tree and she intended to hurt someone. Reckless would be where she just closed her eyes and was drinking and decided she was going to run into something. Didn't necessarily mean to hurt the passenger, but she did have an extreme disregard for what she was doing. Wantonness was a willful disregard for what reasonable care would be, meaning she was drinking, it was a combination of negligent acts that created more than just simple negligence but wantonness. Now if it was just she accidentally ran the stop sign and hit a tree, that's just simple negligence. It was not as culpable as those other levels were. But they would all be brought and those all could be brought through a civil suit. Um, we've talked about duty and we've talked about the breaches of those duties. Now let's talk about causation. Once you've established that there is a duty and once you've established that there's a breach of that duty you have to show that the breach of that duty caused in fact a legal cause in fact of the injury and had what we call approximate cause. So when we first start we look at what's called a but-for test and a but-for test means if Nancy has run the stop sign and she has hit another vehicle and the person in this vehicle is injured that person would not have been injured but for Nancy's running the stop sign, but for her negligent actions. And so that's where we start when we look at causation. Now, you get, it gets more complicated if it's, let's say, more than one person hit a driver at one time. Let's say we have concurrent, someone runs a stop sign on each side and sandwiches one car. Well, it's a little difficult to say, well, it was just Nancy and it was just this person. So then we have to join the parties and what you look at is a, a substantial factor test. Um, and that's, you know, standing alone, one person didn't do it, but together they're both going to be jointly and severally liable. Um, we have different types of, of foreseeability. When we talked about the but-for test is was the act 
was the causation, was it foreseeable? Just like when you're talking about a breach of duty, you're going to talk about what's the reasonable person's standard. When you're talking about causation, you're going to talk about foreseeability and how foreseeable was something. And the first one I have listed here is a foreseeable result without any intervening causes. That's direct causation. You rear-ended somebody, you ran a red light, it's very clear. You ran it, you hit someone, and it caused the injury. Nothing else happened. That's the, that's the most simple type of causation as it gets. And then it gets a little bit more complicated. Let's say you had a foreseeable result with a foreseeable inter intervening cause or indirect causation. Now let's suppose Nancy runs a stoplight and hits someone. This person has a broken arm and they go to the hospital. And while they're being treated for their injuries, the doctor commits medical malpractice. Is Nancy liable for that? She is. She and the doctor both. Because of indirect causation, a force arises after the defendant's negligent conduct, but the force which intervened was actually foreseeable at the time of the defendant's negligence. Liabil liability will ensue. And I've got listed on there on the examples on the next page is one of them is the subsequent medical malpractice, negligence of a rescuer, or efforts to protect person or property. Meaning if someone set fire to my house and I was running in to try and save my animals or I was trying to save my furniture or my baseball card collection and I was burned then yeah that's just gonna be liable for that too. Um, the next one is a foreseeable result with unforeseeable intervening circumstances. Now, this one took me some time to try and think of an example but let's suppose you had a landlord by the name of Mr. Mountain who owned a shopping center and you had to have lights in this shopping center parking lot and the purpose of those lights, of course, is to protect your vehicles when it's out there so you can see when you're getting in to promote uh, or to keep criminal activities from happening within the parking lot. And let's suppose someone is walking to their vehicle and the lights aren't working. He knows the lights aren't working, but he hasn't had them fixed yet. And someone gets hit by a car. Is he liable? Now, first, the person that hit him is going to be liable. Secondly, he's going to be liable as well. Now, the lights themselves may not have been intended for that purpose, and it may not have been a foreseeable result that someone would be coming through the parking lot and hit someone, but still, he had a responsibility to do so. And under the but-for and foreseeability test, he's responsible. Now, let's say we have an unforeseeable result with no intervening forces. Nancy runs a stop sign. I think this is the sixth stop sign that she's run. And she hits a pedestrian, and that pedestrian has a very complicated type of an osteoporosis or some other debilitating bone disease, and it breaks almost every bone in the person's body. This person is what we would call an eggshell plaintiff. Now, let's say she was only going five or six miles an hour, but she did roll through the stop sign. This person has to have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medical surgery to repair the special bones and the special disease that this person has. Is she responsible for all of that or is she just responsible for what an average plaintiff would have incurred? Average plaintiff, who, who thinks that she'd be responsible for all of them? You're right, she would be responsible for all of them and that's what we call the eggshell plaintiff rule and that means you take your plaintiff as they come. So if you hit someone that's got a, some sort of a defect or a special condition then that person is also protected just as they come, not just as what a reasonable person would do or a reasonable person would be injured. And that's kind of difficult to say what would happen to a, I mean, are we going to go out and start running over to people to see exactly how they're going to get hurt or we have to take them as they come? And I think that's the more logical approach. And we talked a little bit earlier about liability. If more than one person commits an act at one time. And in Alabama, we have what's called joint and several liability. For instance, if we had a truck driver who was traveling down, was it 565 here, and they run over someone, they're not paying attention, and they hit another car. And let's suppose that this driver was intoxicated. He was taking some sort of a pill or something. And his company, and he was in the, it was just suppose he's in the line and scope of his duty, and he's employed by a trucking company. Now, he committed the wrong. He committed the actual wrong of hitting this person. 
But if you went back and looked at the records, let's say they didn't do a background check. Let's say he'd been in five or six accidents just like this where he'd been taking drugs. Let's suppose that they don't have a drug policy at the trucking company. Now, they're also responsible for what he's done. Now, who do you sue? Do you sue the truck driver or do you sue the trucking company? You sue them both. Let's say that you get a $25,000 judgment against both. They say that, yes, this driver was negligent, and they say, yes, the company was negligent. They both committed a wrong. And you've got a $25,000 judgment. Who do you collect it from? That's right. You collect it from both. Now, you can't get $25,000 from both of them, but you can collect all $25,000 from the company, or you can collect all $25,000 from the person. Just however you want to do it. That's what we call jointly and severally liable. So yes, together, they're both responsible for what happened, and severally, they're both responsible for the verdict. I have a question. Is it yes, ma'am. Like that, um, and you get a $25,000 settlement, mm -hmm. but your medical bills are $100,000. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any recourse in that? Um, well, first, I'd fire my attorney and I'd probably hire a new one um, because it, I guess it would depend on what was available. If there was only $25,000 worth of coverage available, you would hope that you put your medical bills on some sort of an insurance that covered. But if they didn't, then there's not a whole lot you could do. But I think that any attorney worth their salt would make sure that their client was taken care of or that they got every penny that was out there, particularly from the insurance companies. But what you generally want to do, and I always advise my clients to do so, and I think as a general rule we do in the firm, is that you need to use your health insurance. If you've got Blue Cross Blue Shield and you have $100,000 worth of medical bills, Blue Cross Blue Shield will already pay for, let's say they have a contract with the hospital to pay 60% or 60 cents on every dollar. By me taking the case, I've already cut that by my percentage or my contingency fee. So that cuts it down even further. And then you can negotiate with them. In this instance, let's say you had all of that work done, you're unable to work, you're unable to take care of your children, you can apply for a hardship, in which case Blue Cross Blue Shield may even waive the entire balance and you wouldn't have to worry about that. But generally speaking, if that's all that's there, that's all you can do. Yes, sir? Limited to, uh, to what's there, or you could get judgment, mm -hmm. <clears throat> even though there may not be any assets there now, if assets occur in the future, you could possibly collect. Yeah, so the gentleman in the back was asking about what if we collect, what if we got a judgment and didn't collect all of it. You can go down, you take your judgment, you go down to the probate court and you record your judgment there and then you have a, a certified judgment. Now what you've got to watch out for is, is it going to get discharged if he files for bankruptcy and are they ever going to have anything to pay for it? Now if they sell any property or purchase any property within the county where you registered that, then they'll automatically attach a lien on that property. It'll be outstanding that, that someone does have a judgment against you. And so that will help you collect it. But most of the time, if they don't have it to begin with, they're not ever going to have it. Um, talk to you all a little bit about the guest statute, but I want to talk about some other defenses. Now, when we talked earlier, we talked about just the four basic elements of negligence. That was duty, breach of that duty, causation, and damages. And now we've met what's called the prima facie case. That means to get started before the defense puts on any kind of their defenses or cross-examines any witnesses or puts up anything, have you made a prima facie or beginning showing of those four elements? And once we've made those elements, let's say we have already done Nancy with the stop sign. We've already She's run the stop sign, we can prove our damages, we can prove that the accident caused those damages, and we can show that she did in fact do it. Well now let's look at over here at some defenses. One we just talked about was the guest statute. If I was a passenger, it doesn't really matter. If she was just simply negligent, that's a complete defense to negligence. Let's say we have um, uh, contributory negligence. Have you all ever heard of contributory negligence? That's where the plaintiff also committed a wrong. Say Nancy was Nancy was driving through the stop sign and I reached over and covered her eyes and she didn't see the stop sign. Well, I kind of caused some of that myself. Therefore, I don't have any recourse against her. Um, a lot of them that you'll see are what we call um, the assumption of the risk. And this happens in 
Um, you see this defense a lot and that means that you were engaged in conduct that you knew or should have known was dangerous. Have y'all ever been to the beach and seen those bungee cords where the people jump off those little bungee platforms? I, I don't do that, but I've seen it done. And I know that when you go in there, you have to make you sign that little contract. Sure enough, what does it say? It says, you're aware that this is a dangerous activity. You're aware that something and anything can go wrong. We are not responsible if anything happens to you. Sometimes courts will uphold those agreements. Sometimes they won't. But that would be an example of an express assumption of the risk, where you have been expressly told this is dangerous and you're aware of this danger. Now, you also have what's called implied assumption of the risk, where you knew or should know or somebody told you it was dangerous but you didn't really have it in writing. That's an implied assumption of the risk. And the best example I can think of is anybody been snow skiing. They have lots of, and they've even enacted laws in the Northeast where if you are skiing and you run into one of those poles, you know that they have the, the, uh, the chairs going up and down. If you run into those poles, they have specific statutes that says you can't sue for that because by skiing and going downhill, you saw the pole coming up and you know you're going to be going fast going down, then you assume the risk by getting up there that you could possibly hit one of those poles. And the law started by, it was an implied assumption of the risk, and the courts bounced around in the Northeast, and they just went ahead and passed a statute that said it is an implied assumption of the risk that you could hit one of those poles. Um, and finally, there are also certain types of immunities that people can be afforded. Let's suppose that uh, Nancy uh, was wanton in her activities or reckless in her activities. And the person that was injured that was her passenger was her daughter. Does her daughter have a cause of action against Nancy? Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. In Alabama, I know that there are certain types of negligent, negligence acts that are prohibited by one plaintiff being related to the other and bringing a cause of action. Can y'all think of what the purpose of that is? Insurance fraud is what they're trying to do. Is they're trying to prevent insurance fraud. Because you can imagine how many people probably sit around and need money and talking to their wife or talking to their son or daughter and come up with a scheme to commit insurance fraud where they go run the car into the tree and hurt somebody. So eventually they just had to create a family type of immunity, a family relationship immunity. We also have a charitable foundation immunity. Lots of nonprofit and charitable organizations will also be immune from suit. And that's because the primary function of these organizations is not for profit. They are to help the community. So it's not as though they are taking money in consideration from the community and then hurting the community. Their sole purpose is to help. Their sole purpose is to provide an asset to the community, not to make money. So in certain instances, they are also afforded an immunity where you can't sue them. Um, also, we have uh, a governmental immunity. We've handled several of these cases, and these are some of the most mind-boggling and head-scratching of cases. You also have immunity for the city, you have immunity for the state, and you have immunity for the United States government. You can't sue the state of Alabama. You cannot sue the state of Alabama. You may sue the Department of Transportation, you may sue the head of the Department of Transportation. You may sue a government employee, but you can't just sue the state of Alabama. Now, once you have sued a department head or once you have sued a lower level employee, that person may also be entitled to a type of immunity. It's what we call discretionary function or absolute immunity or a qualified immunity. Meaning, were they involved with their ministerial duties and did they perform the types of procedures that they should perform? Was it something that was in the scope of their employment that they did? For instance, we have a police officer. He arrests somebody. He gets, on the, he gets on the radio. There's a woman running down the street in a pink sweater, and she has just robbed a liquor store. And as you're walking out here this evening, a cop tackles you and arrests you, and it wasn't you, and he hurt your arm. Well, he was performing his duties, and it was an honest mistake, and they don't want you to bankrupt the government, what it boils down to but no, you're not going to have a direct cause of action. Um, we also have, there's certain statutes enacted that will help, uh, that provide a way to sue uh, a... a
governmental function, uh, excuse me, a governmental entity if there is such a recourse available. Such things as Title IX in 1983 and those types of federal statutes will provide the step-by-step -step as to how you sue. In particular, we also have what's called the Federal Tort Claim Statute. And if you have a tort that can be brought, whether against a, a postal driver or against a doctor who's paid by the federal government, then you have to go through the Federal Tort Claims Act and you have to sue in federal court. And you may or may not be entitled to a jury. They narrow it down pretty specifically. But as a general rule, if you're going to sue the government, they're going to be immune and it's going to be an uphill battle. It's not like suing an individual. Well, um, does anybody? Go ahead. You can sue the federal government if the government agrees to the suit. They have to consent to the suit. Yes. Sir. The king can do no wrong. Then. Yes, sir. That's, uh, and what he's talking about, the king can do no wrong, is actually this type of governmental immunity used to be called sovereign immunity. We don't call it sovereign immunity anymore, but that's what it was called in England before it came over here, and that was the principle, is that the king can do no wrong. Therefore, you can't sue the king, or in our instance, can't sue the government. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, well, I'm finished with my portion of the talk. I'm sorry? When would they agree to let you sue <laughs> I think, I'm sorry, she asked, um, she asked when, when the government, he, he stated earlier that the government, you can sue the government if they consent to suit. And her question was, when would they consent to suit? Um, I've been practicing five years and I've never heard of the government consenting to a suit. And I probably doubt they would. Um, unless it was some sort of an issue that needed to be taken up, like a civil rights issue or... Uh, some sort of a question like that, they might entertain a suit. If it was purely monetary, I doubt that they would, they would acquiesce to that. Um, well, yes, ma'am. What would be a legitimate uh, claim against a char charitable organization for the lawsuit? <laughs> she wanted to know what would be a legitimate claim against a charitable organization. Um, you know, I really don't know. That's a good question. Um, the, most of the statutes that I have seen prohibit suit against charitable organizations, such as uh, churches. A lot of churches have um, immunity. So if you, were to, uh, if you were to have a slip and fall, or they were to have a wet floor, and you were to slip and hurt yourself, you may not be able to sue the church, like you could a Costco or a Walmart or something. But uh, a suit that you could bring against the church or another charitable organization, I really don't know. I really have never delved into that, and I don't know. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I have finished, and I'm going to introduce now my senior partner, and I guess it's after five, so I can call him my father. This is uh, Delane Mountain. Uh, he is a senior partner in Tuscaloosa at Mountain Beard and Mountain, and he is, I want to pat him on the back, he's been practicing law for 40 years as of this year, uh, and he is my boss and my mentor and uh, it's, a, it's a true joy to work for him. And uh, if y'all would, thank you so much for giving me your time, and I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Mountain. Uh, I want to talk some about damages, but before I do, I, I feel compelled to go into something I talked about last year, and, and y'all forgive me because I know y'all will remember to be here. I see a lot of new faces, and it's this thing about insurance coverages that we talked about, and I feel really the need to talk about this because so many people are so inadequately insured on their cars in Alabama. Uh, and I ask people all the time, and I did it again this week, and I've done it so many times since I was here last year and over the 40 years that I've practiced, what kind of coverage do you have? And I hear that same answer over and over, full coverage. And if I ask you tonight, there'd be a bunch of you, I won't make you raise your hands, but most of you would say full coverage. And I say to, to them, what is full coverage? And I've yet in 40 years gotten an answer to that question because they're, what is full coverage? Who knows? I don't know. What, I know what you mean by that, that you go to the agent and you trust that agent to take care of you by saying, get me full coverage. In other words, cover me for everything. But they're not doing that, uh, particularly the agents that work for a company uh, because their companies instruct them on, on things to do. They write you minimum limits policy, which in Alabama is 20-40-20. $20,000 if you are negligent and injure someone. $40,000 regardless of how many is in that car or how many got injured. Uh, if there's two, then each of them can get 20. If there's five, then 
All five of them can split up 40000 somehow. Uh, property damage, $20,000. That's the 20, 40, 20. That's the coverage that most uh, insurance agents will write you if you don't specify. Now, if you have a really good agent who's been uh, your agent for many, many years, they may feel like they're taking care of you and they might write you 50, 100, 25. Uh, and thinking they're doing your uh, job. But I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to the hospital today and spend three or four days, uh, your bill is forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 easily many times. Certainly $25,000 will be eaten up like that. Guess who is liable for all of the damages that person sustains as a result of your negligence if it is more than your coverage? You are. And so that's when, when uh, I, I get concern when the people say I've got full coverage and no you don't if you've got damages out there that exceed the coverage that you have you're not fully covered you're putting yourself and everything you own at risk and and I see that so often and the times that I see it unfortunately are after it's occurred usually I'm on the other side I'm representing the people that have been hurt or injured because that's what we do in our practice we don't represent defendants or insurance companies there's nothing wrong with with doing that, we just, I chose 40 years ago not to do that, and I don't. I prefer to represent uh, individuals against corporate insurance companies. And when those people come to my office and they have these humongous bills, 50, 100, $200,000, and we look at the coverage that's available from the defendant who caused the wreck at their, at their fault, and their coverage is 20, 40, 20, it's extremely sad. And, and somebody asked the question earlier, what if your bills exceed uh, $50,000 or $25,000 uh, or $20,000 in this case? The reason I keep saying 25 is there's a bill that's passed the House in Alabama to up it to 25. You know, they had not passed the Senate yet. But that's $5,000 more. But if your bills exceed that, uh, somebody's liable for them. If you have Blue Cross Blue Shield or something like that, then you're... Blue Cross Blue Shield carrier is liable for them. Uh, if you don't, then you're liable personally. Even if you have Blue Cross Blue Shield, they're going to want to subrogate by that, get their money back that they've paid out. So when you settle, if you settle with the wrongdoer, the insurance company, for $20,000, guess who wants that $20,000 back? Blue Cross Blue Shield. Now that did not used to happen in Alabama. There used to be some made whole theories and so forth, but our current Alabama Supreme Court uh, did away with that uh, several years ago. Uh, unfortunately, if you see now, and I hope I don't get put in jail by the Supreme Court for saying this, but it's the truth, uh, if you look at the decisions that come out of our Supreme Court now, you don't find a lot of plaintiff-friendly decisions. Uh, it's unfortunate, but I will debate that with anybody. Uh, we, we look at them, we look at everyone that comes out of there, and if you'll look at the number of decisions that come out of that court that even uphold a plaintiff's verdict, it's very rare. Uh, you, you more likely see uh, cases like the Exxon case, uh, the state where they're reversing verdicts, reversing verdicts, uh, and they pass laws that people are not aware of by their decisions, which is legislature you think passes all the laws, but the Supreme Court does it too. And those laws affect plaintiffs and people bringing lawsuits very directly. And, it, and it's, a, it's a tough situation many times in Alabama. But anyway, I just wanted to say that so you'll go home and look at your insurance policy. If you've got 20, 40, 20, you really ought to consider uh, up in that. It's not that much money, but you're giving yourself more protection. And even if you've got, if you've got 50 or 100 or if you've got an agent who's written you 100, 300, Look to see how much underinsured, uninsured motorist coverage they wrote you. It'll be $20,000 because that's the best buy for you and the worst profit motive, I mean profit product for the insurance company. And so they won't write it for you. They, and, and uninsured, I'm sorry, uninsured and underinsured is coverage that you buy on your own policy. So when you run into that situation where there is a, a person who's caused you injury through a wreck, and your damages exceed their coverage, then you can come back to your policy and get up to your limits on your policy for yourself, for your injuries, for your medical bills, uh, up to whatever limits are written you. So if you've got 100, 300, then you're protecting somebody out there that you don't know up to $100,000 or several people up to $300,000. 
And if he's writing you 20,000 UMUI, then you're protecting yourself 20,000. Well, I think as much of myself as I do any stranger out there, so I insist that my UMUI coverage uh, is on up there where my other coverage is. And it's very inexpensive to do that. That's why they don't write it for you. So y'all look at your policies when you go home. I, I just had this situation occur again this week, and I've had it so many times over the years, and it's such a sad situation. And people don't know uh, because nobody wants to try to just get out of the responsibility that they have when they cause injury to somebody. And you don't want to put yourself at risk for losing whatever you have or making yourself go into bankruptcy because you didn't carry sufficient coverage. What I'm supposed to be talking about is damages. And I'm going to talk very quickly because we don't have a lot of time left for that. But I thought that was even more important. Some of the, most of the stuff on damages we've talked about before on, on uh, different ways. But uh, damages in a tort case, as Clint told you, is based on fault. Now, this is not a situation where plaintiffs are going to the courthouse with a bag and they fill up that bag with money. That's a fallacy that's been created by those people who uh, fund these uh, tort reform groups, big corporations, tobacco money, uh, pharmaceutical companies have, have for many years put forth programs across the nation to try to get jurors when they get in the box to either not render a verdict or keep those verdicts down. But you have to remember that the verdicts are based on fault, on fault of the person that you're suing. And the duty is on the plaintiff bringing that lawsuit to prove that fault up to the standard of negligence that's required, I mean up to the standard that's required, but whether it be negligence or wantonness, uh, before they can even get to a jury, before the defense has to say one word, you have to present a case that is sufficient that a, an appellate court would affirm it if it went to the appellate court at that level. So all of the burden is on the plaintiff to take that duty. You have to prove not only the negligence, you also have to prove all of the damages. And there's two types of damages. Compensatory damages and punitive damages. Compensatory damages are those damages which are intended to compensate you for that loss. For that loss. And that's another thing that I find juries many times are, are somewhat reluctant to do. And they're reluctant because of, of a lot of, uh, of indoctrination that we've had over the years by some of these uh, insurance companies and others who would like to see juries keep those verdicts down uh, and when I say keep them down keep them down below what the people are legally entitled to uh, I have never asked a jury in 40 years to render a verdict that exceeded the amount that my client was legally entitled to and could prove and I have stood before many of juries and made that very statement to them I do not want you to render a verdict in this case for one penny more that my client legally is entitled to and legally deserves and that I have legally proven to you in this courtroom. And that's the standard that's supposed to be used and that's the standard that any good plaintiff's lawyer will use in presenting a plaintiff's case to a jury. All we're asking for is that the elements uh, of those damages be taken into consideration by a jury and, and, uh, and then compensate for those. And let me tell you what those are. Medical expenses, loss of earnings, loss or damage to the ability to earn. These are all possible damages. They don't necessarily occur in every case. Some cases, all of them occur. Physical pain and suffering that you go through. And mental anguish, which is a valid damage, contrary to what uh, uh, some people will argue to you. A mental anguish can, can, can certainly be one. If you're injured in an accident, uh, you're facing $100,000 bills, you're not able to work, you don't have money to support your family, you don't know where the money's going to come from. If you think you don't worry and are concerned, I have seen people that would go night after night without sleep uh, because they worried about these things that, and that worry was brought on by the fault of another party in an accident. That's mental anguish and those are the type legitimate mental anguish claims that are presented to a jury when they exist. Uh, permanent injuries and disabilities and disfigurement are two others. One thing that I think needs to uh, merit some attention is that attorney fees are never included in what we can talk to, to a jury about. 
we work on a percentage basis because our clients can't afford to pay us the hourly rates that are charged. Yes, sir. How do you determine the monetary amount of uh, uh, pain and suffering and mental anguish? It's up to the. It's up solely to the jury's sound discretion. You have to make that determination yourself. The same way you decide uh, uh, what some other things are are valued at. You just have to make a, a sound judgment of it. There's no measure that you, that you can be given uh, of, you know, five nights worries worth X amount of dollars. It's just how bad was it and how much is that worth? And you have to decide uh, how much mental anguish is worth. Punitive damages very quickly uh, are served two purposes. And punitive damages in Alabama require a higher standard of proof. You prove uh, preponderance of the evidence for negligence. But if you want punitive damage, then you have to go another step higher. Now, it's not as high as beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's not too far from it. It's called clear and convincing evidence. And without clear and convincing evidence standard being met, and the courts weigh this, even after the jury verdict is in and it goes on appeal, the courts weigh the evidence to see if it reached that level. And if it doesn't, they'll throw a punitive damage uh, verdict out. And punitive damages are for the purpose, first off, to punish the wrongdoer for their wrongdoing in a civil manner, not criminally, but civil. But more importantly, and secondly, uh, the deterrence factor. In other words, to let others know that this wrong will not be tolerated, and therefore, don't do it any more yourself and others who hear about the verdict, you don't do it either. That's why the, one of the reasons the verdict in the Exxon uh, case in Alabama was so large. They had committed, according to the plaintiff's lawyers and according to the jury, a fraud on the people of Alabama by intentionally preventing them from getting monies they're entitled to. Now, the Supreme Court said uh, no fraud was committed, but <coughs> plaintiff's lawyers would disagree with that. With that. Uh, that's all right. I thought it was me for a second. Anyway, he's showing me my time is up back there. Uh, I always enjoy coming to Huntsville. I'll see you again next year. And thank you very much for letting us come.